Rogan. Welcome to The Realignment. Great to be here. Good to see you, Josh. Likewise. So one of the things I wanted to get with you, first of all, I want to say at the top, I loved your book. This is one of my favorite current affairs books, I think, of the entire Trump era. And you were able to capture a dynamic that just not many people have been able to, from the strategic level all the way down to the actual physical reporting. But I actually love the way that you started off the book by talking about how a lot of people, younger people in particular, tend to have, quote unquote, awakening stories about the U.S.-China relationship being the most important of their lifetime. And you go into yours. Could you tell the audience about that? Because I found it so compelling. Yeah, sure. Uh, Glad you enjoyed the book. The bottom line is that, you know, for a small group of China hands inside Washington and around the world, you know, this idea that the U.S. and China are headed towards increasing confrontation was, I guess, well understood. But what I was trying to document is not the discussion amongst the China hands, but the uh, larger awakening around first the U.S. government and then uh, Washington and then around U.S. society as people started to realize that uh, the rise of China was no longer some faraway issue that uh, didn't affect them in their daily lives. And, you know, for me, it was in 2003 when I was working at a law firm in Philadelphia and uh, we were suing the government of Sudan against uh, for genocide, for perpetrating genocide in what was then sa- southern Sudan. And uh, I came across all of these documents showing what China's strategy was in Sudan at the time. And long story short, it was very crazy and ugly and scary. And what they were doing was they were abusing economic, diplomatic, and political relationships to funnel weapons uh, into the country to help the government perpetrate a genocide against the people of southern Sudan in order to build oil infrastructure to then get the oil back to China. And it was, you know, uh, at that time, you know, stories about China's uh, activities in Africa weren't as well known as they are today. And so I sent the documents to my friend in Washington, Josh Eisenman, who at that time was working uh, for the New America Foundation. He's like, oh, we got to publish this. So we published an, an op-ed in the Straits Times of Singapore that was said, uh, you know, China must play by the rules in oil rich Sudan. And we made a simple argument that, you know, we have a national security and a moral interest in caring about what China is doing around the world, especially when it's something that's horrendous. And you know, I almost got fired from my paralegal job because I wasn't supposed to be, I was a 24 year old paralegal was not supposed to be publishing about the case. That wasn't what they were trying to do. And uh, I was like, oh man, you know, and then I applied for a job at the Japanese newspaper and I sent them that article and they're like, oh, you you broke a big story. Come on down. Next thing I knew, I was a Pentagon reporter for the Japanese newspaper. And, you know, that was just sort of my entry into Washington journalism in 2000. For and over the, the 17 years that I've been covering Washington for eight different news organizations, uh, you know, I've been tracking the China story. And that doesn't mean I'm a China hand. It just means I'm a journalist covering China and the U.S.-China relationship. And over that time, you know, bit by bit by bit, different parts of Congress and then uh, the law enforcement community, then the intelligence community, and then, you know, academia and then Wall Street and then uh, Silicon Valley and then Hollywood are all sort of co- coming to this realization that, wait a second, the rise of China and the actions and character of the Chinese Communist Party is affecting us. And we don't know what to do about it. It's a problem. And like, hey, does anyone else have this problem? And then they started to interact with each other. And it was all a mess because, you know, we're not organized in the U.S. institutions, you know, don't like it when the when the U.S. government tries to tell them what to do because they defend their independence from government in our system rightly and fiercely. But yet this was a problem that they had to work with the Trump administration on that they didn't trust. And so, you know, that kind of slow but steady awakening sped up hugely in the Trump era for a number of you know, reasons that we can talk about. And then once the pandemic hit, it was like, OK, well, now, the, it, you know, it was the doubt was removed from the mind of not only every American, but every citizen in the world who is sitting in their house, can't see their grandmother, praying they don't get coronavirus and knowing on some level, and we can debate what the level is, that the Chinese Communist Party's actions and behaviors contributed to their suffering. And so now, you know, I didn't know when I started writing the book that that was going to happen. I wish it hadn't happened, but we are where we are. So now the question is, okay, we all realize that this is a problem. Now, what do we do about it? Right. 
something I'm proud of is the fact that we genuinely have a ideologically diverse audience. So there are folks here who are very China hawkish, but there also is that segment of the audience that's deeply skeptical of the American role in world affairs. So what they are going to be thinking when you talk about China and Darfur in 2003 is they would say, but Josh, that was the same year the U.S. invaded Iraq. Iraq war, all that disaster. Some people are going to think that was done for oil and for Halliburton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How is China doing what they see the U.S. doing already a big deal, right? So basically they're saying their reaction is probably going to be, okay, Josh, so China, just like other great powers, is using resources, furthering its own interest and not caring about genocide. What is unique in that story and why does that matter in the Chinese context? Right. No, I understand that, you know, the project of like, you know, U.S. foreign policy, internationalism and intervention has faced challenges and <laughs> mistakes have been made. OK, I'm not like I don't really think it's like, you know, debatable at this point. OK, uh, but, you know, Iraq is not Syria, is not Afghanistan, is not China. They're different countries. OK, we need to talk about them differently. OK, because they're different challenges and they require different thinking. OK, so let's not, you know, put everything into the same box. Now, when it comes to the, the, the core sort of drive in our country to apply some restraint to US foreign policy, that I get. That's something I can really think we need to engage the American people on because you know there is a such thing as overspending and there is a such thing as overreach and there is a such thing of over militarization and we can't do everything and we can overreact and we need to constantly remind ourselves that there are limits to American power and influence and we need to think about what those limits are and then you know think about what we how we prioritize things within our limited resources okay i'm all for that so you know what i'd like to say to sort of like the restraint anti-interventionist crowd who may be listening is like yes you you have some good points and some grievances okay so let's join in this discussion together all right now if we can get that far then here's the argument that i'm going to make to you is that this is a challenge that a we can't ignore for our security prosperity, freedom, and public health, be that it will take both the, the right and the left to come to some sort of consensus on common sense measures to start to address this challenge, to see that it's not a military challenge per se, okay? And that's like, you know, and, you know, you, you know it, just because you, we have a bunch of hammers doesn't mean every problem is a nail. And this is a competition that's economically focused and technologically focused, but there is an ideological and political and military component to it. So we just have to like, you know, take our discussion to one half more level of nuance to say that, you know, yes, we, we don't, we can't militarize this. We can't, you know, demonize Asians and Asian Americans. We can't be McCarthyite, all of those extremes that the you know that the restraint crowd is uh, concerned about. I'm concerned about those extremes too. I stand with you in being concerned about those extremes. Okay. At the same time, we got to deal with this problem, and it's a huge problem. And it's not just about China's actions inside of its own borders. Although, as a human being and a humanist, I I I I I, I you know cry when I think about the suffering of a million Uyghurs in concentration camps and the history of you know, my ancestors and how we're repeating these never again moments on our watch and how that's like a failure of humanity. That makes me sad. OK, but as a foreign policy analyst, I'm more focused on what China is doing outside of its borders. OK, and it's mm -hmm. not really about changing China. We don't want regime change. It's not about create, making them to be more like us. In fact, if you read the book and I hope you all will read the book Chaos Under Heaven, you will see that I argue very clearly that we, China is not ours to change. China's development will be guided by the Chinese people one way or the other. But when it runs up against our freedom, prosperity, security, and public health, then we have an interest in doing something about it, okay? And the last thing I'll say on this is like, you know, all, this is more of a far left thing than a far right thing, but it sounds like, oh, what, what do you want to know, the Cold War? We're doing a Cold War. Haven't you read the third crap? Blah, 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 blah. Okay? We're I gonna get it. to that specifically. Yeah, yeah. In these, save uh, it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna save that, yeah. but it, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a false choice. It's a red yeah. herring, it's a bumper sticker. It's a straw man, but we can get to that later. Good. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny because you both argue against the Thucydides trap framework, you argue against the Cold War framework, so we wanted to define that and get sure. that out. But just one quick thing that really interested in me when you were talking about, especially the younger China hands folks, because this definitely felt like a bit of, you weren't obviously calling out Sagar and I, but you called out an instinct that we had the first season of the show, which was all about the who lost China debate, 
Um, right, so right. obviously in 1949, there's this very intense debate over who lost China in U.S. foreign policy, what leads to Mao um, and the Chinese Communist Party defeating Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists. That is a huge debate, which fuels the excesses which you referenced earlier, the McCarthyism, HUOC, all of those really terrible things come from the really bad faith interpretation of a situation where it might not have been anyone's to lose in the first place. There's an updated version of the Who Lost China debate, which is really focused on the two 2000s. We had Robert Spaulding. We had Peter Navarro. So people who you've talked about in the book on the show and our episodes were incredibly focused on that who lost China debate. And the point you kind of make is who cares? We're kind of, yeah, who cares? So why, why, who cares? Why, right? how Help us. Information, you, you know, and don't get me wrong. Like, uh, you know, and so, you know, like I, 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 it's the bet that we made, right. Which was that if we just engage China as much as possible, integrate them into our systems as much as possible, throw a bunch of money at them and let them throw a bunch of money at us, that that would eventually get us all so chummy and wrap them into our way of life that they would liberalize economically and then that would lead them to liberalize politically. And that would lead to solving all of our problems. We'd live in peace and happiness and coexistence. It would be wonderful, right? That was the bet, okay? A bet that we had no means to enforce once the help was proffered. Now, I, as like, again, a young sort of Asia hand journalist in the mid out aughts, you know, I'm hanging around listening to all of these older scholars. Oh, well, saying on the one hand, maybe that was the only responsible thing to do. In other words, we had to give China a chance to become more like us, but they just decided to go another way. And then some of the other scholars, the ones who are like, feel vindicated now, are like, oh, no, that was a crazy idea. They were never going to do that, right? And some will say, oh, well, that's still the right thing to do right now. Now that gets sort of back to your restraint crowd, right? They're like, oh, what the, that's the mm -hmm. only responsible thing to do. And what I'm trying to say is, is that for the younger generation of major hands, who are now middle-aged, you know what I mean? Uh, we didn't give it a, a crap about any of that because we weren't around when the bet was made. So we bore no allegiance to it one way or the other. And we saw China for what it was, not for what the older people wanted it to become or thought it we should think it was, you know? And so that just led to a lot more clear-eyed analysis, not a, a, a monolith of opinion, but a lot less, you know, disagreement about the prognosis than the solutions. And all that is just to say that like we are where we are. And, you know, so many people in the China game are sort of compromised either by their business relationships or their academic and relationships or their, you know, their source bias or whatever it is that makes you believe that, like, you know, we have to relitigate the 2000s. Uh, you know, can we just agree that, like, right now the Chinese Communist Party is doing all this crazy stuff that we have to sort of think about and respond to? And then we can talk about what the responses are. Yeah, I am so glad that you said that. And I want to get to the Cold War thing now, because I think some of the most vehement criti critics of this podcast, of me in particular, come from this idea that acknowledging, like you said, geopolitical competition and especially Chinese behavior outside of its borders and encroachment on a U.S.-led system is in and of itself advocacy for a new Cold War or a state of a Cold War. And one of the things you go very cl clearly to say in the book is, no, like this isn't like the Cold War at all. So the obvious question is why? Why do you think that? Right, right. Now, you know, on the one hand, so first of all, I think that the Cold War analogy has some usefulness, right? In terms of like the scope and the scale of the challenge, mm -hmm. you know, there are some things we learned in the Cold War that worked that didn't work in terms of uh, pressure and alliances and deterrence or whatever. Like, I'm not saying there's nothing to be learned there. I'm saying that the term has become so overused as to be diluted beyond any usefulness. In other words, it, when you hear it, that's, first of all, that's like a sort of a, 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 a quick sign that like whoever is uttering it doesn't really know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? It's like uh, it's it, they're trying to use it as a cudgel against you to warn against doing something to confront China. Or it's the Chinese Communist Party being like, oh, you crazy Americans, what do you want a Cold War? What are yeah, you stupid? Right. Or, you know, it's like, you know, the actual compromised people who do know better, right? But who are arguing against a response for whatever political or personal reason they have. And so anyway, the point is that I do think that, you know, on the Chinese side, if you read the documents, it's clear that Xi Jinping sees himself as in an ideological existential struggle with the West. 
And if you read document number nine, and if you read, just, just read what he says and what he writes. It's not, you know, it's, it's not secret. It's just in Chinese. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you translate it, you can read it. He, th he's saying that their system is under attack from Western forces. And those Western forces include everything from civil society to journalism, to you name it. Okay. That's how they see it, but that doesn't have to be how we see it. We can have a slightly, again, just a half step, please more nuanced approach. Okay. Which is that this is not the cold war. It is a systems battle. It will play out on a number of arenas, in a number of theaters, on a number of continents, in a number of unpredictable and, uh, you know, really, you know, interesting ways. Okay. And so while we can draw some lessons from the Cold War, it doesn't matter what you call it. Okay. It is, I, that's why I just say the China challenge, you know. And the, the other thing about the Cold War analogy that's so terrible is that it sort of pits this as a spat between the US. And China, which is again kind of like a result of the unilateralist part of the Trump administration policy, if we're being honest. But my point is that it's really should be framed as an international response to China as it rises, and a way to rebalance the the China's relationship with the rest of the world to avoid a situation that we can both live with. To avoid the I mean, to create a situation where that we can both live with to avoid the conflict that neither neither side seeks. Yeah. In other words, the goal of the policy has to be to live with China and with the CCP. And that's where I disagree with Peter Navarro. He wants to bring down the CCP. I don't want to bring down the CCP. I just want them to stop doing the things that are harming Americans' security, prosperity, public health, and freedom. And that's not even close to happening yet. Yeah. And let's get to the other big hip phrase that people use. You reference this, the Thucydides trap. God. Firstly, can you just define what the trap is, like what it means on a historical basis, and then are, and then say why you don't believe it applies in this case? Yeah. So, you know, so Graham Allison wrote this article and The Atlantic later turned into a book. Uh, Thucydides trap is based on a, like a misunderstanding of the Peloponnesian War. Like, yeah, we like you read that book in Athens you know, and Sparta it, then. Athens and Sparta. Yeah. We read it like freshman year, right? And the Thucydides trap theory holds that, you know, if there's a dominant power and a rising power and a declining power, that those po that those powers will clash when they pass each other in the risingness and the fallingness. And, you know, what Graham does is he cherry picks 16 examples and then identifies 12 of those that fit. And he's like, oh, that's about 75 percent, you know. But <laughs> so like that's so to, to get into it, because we, yeah. we talked about this with um, Adam Ostavridis last week and a bunch of people yeah. ask questions about this. So the examples are um, the United Kingdom and the Kaiser's Germany leading into World War mm. One. Mm. Um, what are what are a couple of the other mm. examples that he picks? Well, you know, so, you know, it all, and you notice anything similar about all those examples? It's a Western centric view of history. OK that we're trying to fit into China for some odd reason, okay? Mm -hmm. It also, you know, I just happen to believe, and I, this is what I argue in my book, is that, like, you know, there are a lot of reasons countries go to war, and upwardness and downwardness and, you know, and risingness and fallingness is one of them. It's one of them. I'm sure you could find, if, you know, if you search all the conflicts of all of history, and you, you could find 12 of those. Okay, sure. But it doesn't really tell us anything, okay? And, you know, also it's hard to measure the, power and influence of a country, especially over the large sweep of history. Anyway, this is like, you know, this is DC, right? And when somebody gets like a really good, like sort of buzzword and people catch on, it's like, oh, that's really great. We're just going to, we're just going to talk about that forever. And this is like clash of civilizations. That was like the best one, right? That guy yeah. ate off that for like 50 years. Okay. Thucydides trap. Like, I wish I had thought of something like snappy like that. I'd probably sell a lot more books. <laughs> But I'm just I'm making this argument that it's actually just a complex thing that we have to think of in a complex way. And we can't put a bumper sticker on it. If I call my book The New Cold War, yeah, I've been like I would have been, you know, on a lot more shows. But the point is that it's just not that simple. So we just have to just like, you know, everybody take a step back from like the cliche table for one second. So we can have a real discussion about this thing. I'm so glad you said that because people, whenever you get into the destined thing, then you start to ignore like discrete choices that people make, which actually We've much never, more dramatically. Go yes. ahead. Yeah. We've never seen yeah. something like the Chinese Communist Party right. that's running China right now, which has unlimited money, unlimited power, no depths to which they will not lower themselves in order to get advance their interests and no thing that they won't subject their own people to if that's what they feel they want to do. And- that is just something that we don't have a, a quick name for, and we're not going to have a quick solution for. I'm sorry. 
No, exactly right. And well, actually, well, something both of us loved about the book is you actually contextualize China in a framework very much that we try to talk about on the podcast, which is it intersects with domestic pol politics from a nationalism and populism perspective with the rise of new technology. So Huawei, TikTok, ByteDance, Ant Financial, Jack Ma IPO, and then disappears from the state of the earth or nobody knows where he is, and a changing complete geopolitical order. So can you explain, first of all, how you kind of came to see China within all three of those contexts, and then what it tells us about the scope of the problem set, if you will, because that's what I think just makes it so fundamentally different from anything else that we've ever dealt with. Yeah, I mean, listen, my process was just to report out this story as much as I possibly could, and then also to rely on the excellent work of a lot of journalists working on the same story over the same period of time for a lot of different outlets. I call it the blind men and the elephant. We're all touching different parts of the elephant, mm -hmm. and we're trying to come to, like, it's all our subjective experience, you know. But, you know, the, the common thread throughout was that, you know, what the first of all was that, you know, uh, Ch China's rise in the Chinese Communist Party is actions and strategies were affecting Americans in all different parts of our public life. So, you know, the 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 factory worker, yeah, they knew something was wrong with the U.S.-China relationship because the factory, you know, the guy who yes. has the owns the company that builds the cranes, the, the windmill guy, you know, every person, the, the university professor, the Wall Street, they all sort of you know, it does, it's that's why it's so crossed all the ideologies and all the political spectrums, not to say that everybody came out in the same way. But what the Trump team did, which was smart politically, was and I think a lot Bannon and Miller and Navarro were in part responsible for this during the campaign, was they tied the nationalist populist you know, outrage to the China issue and tapped into that and linked them together. And of course they are linked, but you know, you could also link it to anything else, right? And they 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 were ahead on the polls and they 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 uh, connected them in a way that said to people, oh yeah, it's it's the elites in both countries that are that are screwing you over uh and the Chinese Communist Party, you know, and they're working together. Now we, we can talk that's not exactly true, but it's not, that was smart politics at the time. The problem was that once Trump came in, he handed the issue over to the Wall Street guys like, you know, Mnuchin and, and Ross. And they, you know, and we went back and forth and back. And by the time you got to Pompeo, then, oh, now we've got a national security focus. And then you went back to Mnuchin and then it went back to O'Brien. So that's that's why it's called chaos under heaven, because it really was kind of a mess. But the point is that, you know, the Trump administration changed the conversation into China that can't be undone. And if we take the good from it and leave the bad from it, we could build on to it and something to have something that's sustainable that everyone could, in, could get into. But like both Bannon's theory was always like, oh, we're going to realign the American politics and the China part is going to be a huge part of that. And the far left and the far right are going to come meet at the back. And that's going to be the China vanguard. But that didn't really work out because he got mm -hmm. fired and because the far left and the far right don't actually get along most of the time. Sometimes they do, but you know what I mean? So it, it didn't really work out the way he said that. And then you have like, you know, the, the neoliberals and the neoconservatives who have, you know, some sort of shared sense of the China challenge because of their overlapping interests. So that's just, I, I, I don't know what, I don't know what I'm just, what I just said. I'm just <laughs> trying to explain yes. to you the fact that the only reason I think I got my head around this to the extent that I did was because I touched all of those points of the elephants in one way or the other. And I tried to understand why, you know, the Christian community and now, you know, the manufacturing community and now the human rights community and now the, you know, the, the, the trade community, like, what all are their interests? And everyone has an interest. And sometimes those interests are in competition with each other, even inside the institutions. And the Chinese government is playing inside of our politics and they're manipulating those divisions and they're putting their fingers on those sensitive spots in order to screw with us. And, you know, untangling that is the first part to having an honest discussion. And that's where the influence comes in. That's the united front. It's they find the, the people in our society that are, for whatever reason, doing to, willing to do their bidding and throw a ton of money at them and see what happens. And it's not like the Russian influence where they like do a bunch of Facebook pages and bots and stuff. I mean, they do that too, Chinese Commerce Party. But the real insidious stuff is the long-term co-option of elites that they do it in both parties as much as they can at all levels of government down to the mayors, right? And we, what, what happened to all those mayors? They all, <laughs> somehow all those mayors were getting honey trapped, right? There was a reason, yeah. okay? So 
that's that's the scope and the scale of the influ of the influence problem. And so, in order to untie our interests and our competing interests from the part the Chinese Communist Party interests, we have to expose all of that stuff. So this is the key thing, which is let's go to the timeline because you were talking about the Trump administration. I want to take it back a few years and start with the Obama administration because my reading of the book, and this is rather obvious, so I'm not going to treat this like it was an insight, is this is a tale of three different administrations and three different approaches to the China question or to the China challenge in your phrasing. So what was especially the post-2012 Obama-China policy, and why do you think that policy even if Hillary Clinton had won, wasn't sustainable. Right, right. You know, when Xi Jinping came into power in 20, late 2012, early 2013, you know, somebody, not me, but somebody could be forgiven uh, for believing that he might be somebody we might want to work with. You know what I mean? He's going to be president mm -hmm. and general secretary for 10 years. Let's give this guy a shot. You know what I mean? Like it, you could justify that thinking, okay? And that's basically the approach Obama, Obama took. And keep in mind that the person who spent the most time with Xi Jinping up to that point was Joe Biden, vice president to vice president, 25 hours of dinners and this and that. And, you know, the rest of the top of the administration, the second term now, remember Hillary was out. She was much more hawkish on China and she and Kirk Campbell were doing the pivot to Asia. And then Tom Donilon rebranded it into the rebalance to Asia because it was too yes. aggressive, you know, or whatever. The Europeans were bought her, whatever it happened, you know, and so then. In the second term, you've got John Kerry inviting the Chinese State Council to Boston for his house. They're going to hang out. It's going to be lovely. And then they go to the Palace Hotel and they have a nice lunch. You know, this sounds the wonderful. Idea, <laughs> the idea, I mean, if you just, just look, if you think about the mentality, it's like, well, if we just, you know, become really good friends with these guys, that's going to really make, we're going to have a, a lot of progress. Now, again, I'm not here to say that that was totally a crazy thing to say in 2013. But by 2016, it was like, all right, guys, you, enough is enough, because they had signed the cyber agreement and broken it. They had, he had promised not to militarize the South China Sea, and they just militarized the South China Sea. So right. by the end of the Obama administration, there was already a lot of people inside the system who were like, wait a second, wait a second. Maybe this Xi Jinping guy is not a great guy after all, okay? And then, <laughs> you know, they get to the last meeting, which is in the prologue of the book, and they, you know, they're organizing a handoff and Kerry and Rice say to the Chinese, listen, we're going to be cooperation focus, be wonderful. And then Trump gets elected. <laughs> and I was surprised. I don't know if you were surprised. Pretty I know surprised. the Chinese yeah. were surprised. John Kerry yeah. was definitely surprised. And all bets are off and we're off to the races. Now, you know, what's funny about that is, is that like, you know, if you look at the, when the Biden team comes back in, in 2021, you know, the camps at the end of the Obama administration were like, the real engagers, the optimists like Carrie Ann Rice. And not, that's not to say that they're all in the same place now that they were back then. These people are allowed to evolve, right? And if John Kerry and Susan Rice are in a different place in 2021 than they were in 2020, like good for them. You know, we want to let people evolve, right? And learn things and whatever. But my point is that they were the optimists and their staffers were the competitors, Blinken and Sullivan and these guys. And now they're all back. But the staffers are the principals, Blinken and Sullivan, and Kerry and Rice are the staffers. They literally switched offices. Same people, different offices, okay? And now Blinken is Kerry's boss, right? If we're to believe that's the, actually the case. So And now Kerry's that, doing climate change stuff, right? To right. With China. Yeah, so it's like, yeah. With yeah. China. So, so my point is that because the competitors are now in control of the policy, that's why we're seeing a more continuity in the policy. That's why the Biden team is 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 putting forth a, a tough China approach. Plus, the political incentives are obvious because the polls show that Americans, Democrats, and Republicans like want a tougher China approach. And the Biden people can read the polls; they're not stupid, right? And so you, you add that the competitors are in charge and they have the ball. Plus, the polls say it. That equals a pretty tough China policy. But the fight hasn't happened yet. The dangle hasn't come. Be, be like you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. They're going to come with the dangle. The dangle's coming. Okay. Yes. I don't know what's going to be. Could be like you want a, an Iran deal. We got Iran here. Do you want to, you know, or like, hey, do you want a climate change deal, which would be Kerry's thing? There'll be some dangle. And then the president of the United States, Joe Biden, will have to make a choice between two competing interests, a tough China policy or whatever it is that, and then, you know, they, they get to the climate change deal and they're like, uh, just one thing, uh, we're going to need you to uh, 
forget about the Uyghurs forever. Right. And, you know, and that's how that's that's the scheme. That's or the, the tariffs need to go the or tariffs whatever, to, whatever yeah, it right. is. Exactly. So I think the so fights haven't happened yet. I want to get to that, um, but this is the, I want to focus a lot on Trump in particular because this is where I spend a lot of time looking at, and I think that honestly, it's probably his greatest ideological victory over Washington. But the actual execution of what the hell happened inside of the Trump administration is something we really need to bear out. You wrote that the Chinese consistently misunderstood Trump. So number one, what did they misunderstand? And yeah, let's start with that, and then we'll get to the Trump. The actual and and Trump one quick thing to add to it: it was it wasn't just they yeah. misunderstood him; they then came to conclusions yes, based right. on that misunderstanding that were very important. So, can you just like, articulate that? Yeah. Well, you know, okay. So basically, they misunderstood. They thought that if they if they just worked on the billionaires and worked through the family, that they could cut out all those national secure, pesky national security folks. And, and you mean the Trump all the, family, right? To be precise, the Trump family, Jared yes. and Ivanka, and uh, you know, but also like Steve Wynn and Sheldon Adelson and Larry Fink and Tom, uh, what's what's his name, John Thornton, yes. and all of them, you know, Elliot Broidy and Schwartzman, you know, right? Do we have Steve Schwartzman, yeah. absolutely, yeah. and you know, through various ways, what they thought that you know, essentially, Trump was wanted to make a deal and that he would tell all of these national security folks to go pound sand if these if the and these billionaires if they could just work through the billionaires and like you know one one ro royal family to another royal family kind of thing you know and they had reason to believe that first of all you know but at the same time they were scared uh, like you know to their bones that Steve Bannon was going to take over the China policy and like you know it, it, you know speed the downfall of the CCP with some sort of crazy you know Alex Jones info op or something whatever it was their paranoid delusion right so they they focused on those billionaires right but the problem was that the billionaires were not diplomats they didn't know what they were doing and they were making promises to both sides that neither side could uh, fulfill and essentially they the Chinese got the idea that they didn't really have to do anything right and Trump never really agreed to that okay. Trump wanted a deal, but he wanted to fix the thing that he wanted to fix. He didn't care yes. about the Uyghurs. He cared about the trade deal. And he really he didn't care wanted, about Taiwan. Like that was the he didn't key care thing. about Taiwan. <laughs> he didn't care about Hong Kong. But but he was willing North North Korea he loved, though that's a separate story, right? But he wanted that trade deal to be a real thing. And they never gave him if just imagine if they would have in 2018 or 2017 given him a reasonable trade deal that it would have all been over yeah they, they would have neutered the entire shift in u.s foreign policy towards a more aggressive stance to the ccp but they were so arrogant they didn't give him anything and then by the time it got to the late 2020 they had him because he needed a deal so he just compromised and it was a bad deal for them too by the way because they still kept all the tariffs on but it was a bad deal for us because what's 50 billion dollars or so it doesn't really make a difference and then the pandemic hit right yeah and then it didn't nothing none of that mattered at all so they they totally misplayed it now what's interesting is that you know the at first the trump trump president trump himself and those around him misunderstood the chinese they thought these guys are deal makers and they'll make a deal and they'll just give us what they want and they didn't, they didn't realize that really it's really for Xi Jinping, the party is the most important thing, right? And yes. the politics and the ideology can't be separated. And, you know, that was always going to be a problem. And, and they're not going to change their industrial policy for us. They're just not going to do it. So what the hardliners inside the system, this is the part that I think I reported on, you know, more extensively than had been before, was that they were watching this above them, okay? And Trump and Xi and Sheldon Adelson and Jared, and they can control that. The people inside the system mm -hmm. can control that. I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of people, but they're they're betting. They're just betting, you know, taking a chance on the fact that the CCP will behave like it behaves and act like it acts and not change its ways and be internally repressive and externally regressive. And eventually Trump would realize that. And eventually Trump did realize that to his credit. Yes. But then he kind of messed up that too, but that's a whole nother story. So let's let's actually break that down because I love this and you you articulate this very well. The Wall Street camp pro engagement and then the hardliners and China hawks within the Trump team itself. So let's spell that out. Who are the actual players? Right. The Wall Street people basically ran the table for 2017, kind of the Gary Cohn era. I covered the White House a little bit this time and it was absolutely right. fascinating to watch. But the hardliners eventually do win. 
as you said, because they were just betting that the CCP was going to act like the CCP. What were the assumptions that both teams made in the beginning, and what did they both get right and wrong? So let's start with the Wall Street. Okay. Okay. Well, I should identify at least four or five main camps. So there were the Superhawks. That's Bannon and Navarro and Spalding. And these guys were like, we got to bring down the CCP. We got to bring down the CCP. Okay. They ended up not having as much influence because, you know, they, they weren't good at government or politics. They were like not the cool kids at the table. Okay. Mm-hmm. And Bannon Great, got- Funny anecdote. You I love literally the talk about how for the there. first three weeks, they wouldn't let, Navarro had to work from home because they wouldn't give him They wouldn't seat. give him an office. Like, yeah. <laughs> he was on the campaign every night and he didn't get to see the president for 55 days yeah. or something. They wouldn't let him see him. So one day yeah. he charges into the office with his charts. Like, you know, like right. he's like the dog that caught the car. <laughs> and he gets like 20 minutes to explain his, the economic war against China to Trump. And of course, Trump is like, oh, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. Right. And then Gary comes like, oh, my God, what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So every time Peter would get like 20 minutes with Trump, it would have a huge effect. But you know, that's why they never let him get 20 minutes with Trump. Mm-hmm. The same thing happened at Mar-a-Lago. They kept him out of all the meetings. And then at the, at the end, they're, Trump's like, where's my Peter? That's what he likes to say. Where's my Peter? I, he loved him. Right. Yeah. And then R- in Beijing, quick, one more. I got one more. Yeah, in yeah. Beijing, Mnuchin has Peter go all the way to Beijing and then won't let him into the meeting. And he's standing outside the meeting. He's like, I'm not really, you're not going to let me into the meeting? And he's like, no, we're, you're not, it's a one-on-one. You can't come in the meeting. Peter's like, oh, justifiably, when you, if you flew all the way to Beijing with all, you know how, you know, and then you get to the meeting and Steve Mnuchin's like, sorry, you can't come in the meeting. I would be pissed too. And then they yeah. leaked on him to screw him over, you know, saying, oh, he got, he yelled at, Steve Mnuchin, yeah, I'm pretty sure he, he was justified in that yelling. So uh, anyway, th- that was the Super Hawks. The hardliners were guys like Pottinger. Well, quick, quick, okay. quick, quick yeah. one quick thing. I just, there's an, a very important Peter Navarro story that I want to tell um, that reflects everything you're saying. So A, Peter was on the show, so definitely go back and check our episode from November 2019. But when I was at PBS working on Firing Line, Peter Navarro was a guest and Everything you were discussing was just revealed in that when he was booked for the show, he took the chart. So he has this chart that he would show everyone. He took, he, he rode the Amtrak. He brought the chart with him. He didn't have any staff. So apparently Peter Navarro just rode the Amtrak to New York with this little like chart. And then he just gave yeah. it to Margaret Hoover, the host afterwards. So in our office, we just had Peter Navarro's chart. Nice. Of which he probably has thousands of copies. He loves Just that taped chart. up to the wall. He loves yeah. the chart. And you know, you know who loves charts? Donald Trump. And that's right. Trump huge loves it. fan of yeah. charts. OK, you show that guy a chart. He's going to be right. a happy guy. That, that All right. So super hawks. Who else we got? Hardliners. These are people who wanted a tougher China policy, but didn't want to blow the relationship up for the fun of it. OK, this is like a Mike Pompeo or Robert O'Brien, a Matt Ponger, a Mike Pence, by the way, yeah. uh, John Bolton to some degree. Right. Then you had the, what, the axis of adults. And these are like the Washington, you know, sacred cow old people who like are thought, join the, you know, they think they're saving the Republic from the mad King, right? This is like Jim Mattis and mm-hmm. John Kelly and HR McMaster. And, you know, they've got 40 years of, you know, military or government experience. And they're like loved by the Washington establishment, but inside the tr- inside that white house, they're like, you know, the skunk at the garden party, because they're saying uncomfortable things like we shouldn't pull out of NATO and, you know, right. blah. And so, you know, Eventually, they would all cycle out, but they thought they're like the guardrails, you know, tr- stopping the, the crazy drunk president from driving the car into the ditch. But eventually they would just annoy Trump until they were gone. Right. You couldn't you, you could persuade Trump to do things, but you couldn't badger him into doing things. It never really worked. Right. So anyway, uh, then you had the Wall Street click. This is Gary Cohn, Larry Kudlow, Mnuchin, of course, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, all the billionaires that they brought to bear. And they were just you know, doing everything they could to thwart the national security people at every stretch. And they won a lot. Okay. And sometimes it was a draw. And like that TikTok WeChat thing, that was a total draw. Yes. Right. The national security people got the executive order. Then Mnuchin tried to strike a deal with Oracle and then the the Chinese rejected it. And then the courts froze. It It was a total disaster for everyone because neither side won. So I I forgot what the question was. Well, no, I mean, that's, we're, we're just looking to get. Oh, yeah. And then there was the family. Like a landscape. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. and, well and this, this is, this this is, is key thing. Well, this, you know, and this is how everything you're saying leads to this, which is basically, why was this so deeply personal? Is it always like this? Because because reading the book, the, the key conclusion is, man, like this comes down to, 
or maybe it doesn't, but Trump thinking she is his friend. Um, they're bullying <laughs> Peter Navarro because Peter isn't well socialized. Um, Rob Port, like, you know, the people are good at stealing things out. Like, how is it always this personal? You know, that's a great question, actually. You know, I've covered since, I guess, 2004, one, two, three, four, and this will be the fifth administration. And, you know, what I always noticed in Washington, and I've lived, I went to GW, I've been here on and off from here in Tokyo since 97, so I'm kind of old. And, uh, you know, it was, there was always this like functional dysfunction, right? I, I, I like to describe it that way because it's sort of like, yeah, there, there's too much focus on personalities and everyone's like a, you know, on an ego trip all the time in DC. They think that, and they're like, they're, they think they're like, you know, everyone, everyone thinks they're the smartest person in the room and then they form alliances and cliques and those cliques form what I call assorted alliances that come together based on overlapping interests. All of that is pretty normal. But when you added the Trump sort of disruption and dysfunction on top of that, it crashed it, okay? And it crashed a lot of the systems in our town that weren't working the way we wanted it to. Like, for example, the interaction between the White House and the media, right? That was never great. I was never a, a big fan terrible. of the way that worked. Yeah. But during the <laughs> Trump era, it, it, it was destroyed, okay? And I would argue that that has its own effects. And, I, you know, so he was great at flipping over chessboards, but he wasn't good at setting up chessboards. Yes. And so, yes, it was worse. Everything was worse. The dysfunction was worse. The relate the government media relations were worse. The, the dysfunction inside the system was worse. The confusion went all the way to the top. Uh, that's why you had all the crazy media stories because everyone was like, you know, giving it's like Rashomon. You have like seven firsthand accounts and they're all mutually <laughs> exclusive and everyone thinks they're telling the truth because they're all, you know, half of them are like, you know, can't tell the difference anymore. They're like, it's like OJ walking around and he said he, he doesn't yeah. think he did it. You know what I mean? So what? how do you deal with How do you report that? You know, it's so, I, I'm, 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 I digress. I, I want to hit one quick thing on this. Speaking of people telling stories that fit their yeah. narratives, what I appreciated about this book in comparison to other current events Trump era books was this query was not just written by Steve Bannon whispering things to you in the background because <laughs> it seems like what's limited so many of these books is the fact that Steve Bannon himself is a fascinating interesting character who is able to reflect and then use that to his advantage in multiple tellings so can you just talk about the yeah. reporting part of this I tried my best to be an honest broker okay because I knew that no matter what I wrote it would be attacked by all sides and the book is a Rorschach test and, it, you know, the 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 China engagers think it's too hawkish and the you know, the 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 down with CCP people think it's too uh, dovish. And, you know, there's criticism of Bannon and there's some praise of Bannon and that messes with people's minds. Right. <laughs> and then I, you know, and then I, I have a whole thing on the Wuhan labs, which is in the news, by the way, if you want to talk about oh, that, we're going to get to that. Don't worry. And, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're ending when I wrote that a year ago. I was thinking, I'm like, oh, I'm typing this. I'm doing my best to report the stories as, as I can, but I know what I'm typing and people are going to attack me for it. And now we're here a year later. It actually, it all bared out. It all, you know, right. it's a, it all, it looks pretty normal actually right now. But in that fog, as I'm sitting in my basement in quarantine, I'm just, I, I'm panicked that I'm going to get something wrong. And I'm just, the only thing I can think of is call more people, do more reporting, call it like I see it and let the chips fall where they may. So it's not a pro-Trump book, but it's not an anti-Trump book. The anti-Trump people don't like, they're like, why weren't you harder on Trump? I'm like, because I was trying to be fair to the guy. Because like yeah. it, the, the one thing that the, oh, like, you know, why can't the mainstream media admit that they weren't fair to the guy, despite the fact that he did all these awful things. So if you're fair to him, then you can say that he did these awful things like, or like tell she it was okay to have weaker concentration camps, which is an awful thing to do. Okay. That's a, as a human, that's a terrible thing to say. And for the president to do it shocks the conscience, but I got to be fair to the guy and the other things that he got right in order to have credibility to make that point. So absolutely. That's yeah. all. That's, that's it. That's all I tried to do is just to do as much reporting as possible. It's imperfect. It's, it's an ideal. It's the, the integrity is in trying to be the honest broker. Not in I struggled. I it. struggled with this a lot too, Josh, in terms of talking about Trump, the policy, the strategy, and also the man, and then the people who are literally his family. And right. you bring this across so perfectly, which is that 
because Trump himself is just one of those wheeler dealers with his like personal network, is that the Chinese actually understood that pretty well. And I've heard this um, from many people who've dealt with China. They literally have a term for it, like Guanxi, in terms of your network, your influence network. And because of who he was with his business background, they were able to exploit that to like pretty dramatic effect. Um, you go into Wendy Dang, Rupert Murdoch's ex-wife, her relationship with the Kushner family, the Kushner's own nanny, who was recommended to by Wendy Dang, who itself, there have been reports, um, apparently, and as you report, he was personally warned um, about Wendy Dang might have, uh, being yeah. a Chinese influence operation. Steve Wynn, one of his personal friends, literally hand-delivering a, a letter about extradition of a Chinese dissident here, which went around the State Department. And, you know, I would love to hear about FARA laws whenever it comes to that. Just talk about that element in particular, where it wasn't just that the Chinese were playing the billionaires, because and they certainly were. It's that they were playing that, like, unique ability, like everybody was, in order to get to Trump. The Fox News, hiring the people that they knew he was going to listen to, the cranks that he was calling, you know, late at night. Because this is where separating and understanding, like, Trump the man brings in this just, like, uniquely Trumpian effect to where you just believe this, like, straight-up bullshit about how uh, the Chinese dissident was, like, a rapist, and he was like, we gotta go with this rapist, or, like, you know, Steve, because Steve Because that's Wynn, what she is definitely yeah, super like, concerned about. Right, yeah, <laughs> she is totally concerned about rape and women's rights. These are the greatest women's rights advocate in the history of China. It's like, it, just, it was just one of these crazy elements, because, I mean, I, you know, I met Trump, I interviewed him four times in the Oval, mm. and it, you just nailed him, his, like, all over the -ness, um, to mm. to put it in exactly on that. So just go into it a little bit. Okay, so, yeah. you know, if you, the Guo Wen Guai, Elliot Broidy, Steve Wynn, yeah. and what, the guy from the Fugees, what's his name, Michael? <laughs> He's involved. Yes. That, and, and it's connected to Ben. This is one of, like, the, I think, that we could do a whole podcast on it, but I'm going to try to, like, explain this in the way that you want that gets the point across, which is how crazy this whole thing yeah. was. So, Guo Wen Guai is a Chinese billionaire who's affiliated with the Ministry of State Security. That's like their internal FBI slash CIA. And he's a billionaire. He's like a front for this corrupt part of their security system. He's the business guy associated with a very famous high level right. CCP official. And the CCP official gets purged. He escapes before he gets purged, shows up in New York with David Boyes at the Sherry Netherlands Hotel and buys a $68 million apartment and tries to make friends with all the Democrats, okay? Because he thinks Hillary Clinton's going to be the next president. She loses. He joins Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's making friends with Steve Bannon, okay? And, you know, and he says, I'm a dissident. I need dissident status, okay? And everyone's like, well, okay, that makes a lot of sense. What could be wrong there? So, you know, the Chinese, the, the, the purging part of the CCP, and this is what people don't understand, is that there's different parts. They fight each other. Like, we think we're bad, like, you know, like, there, if you if you say the wrong thing, like you're done. Yeah. Okay, you're cooked. And <laughs> long story short, uh, you know the the other faction that was against Guo starts just running operations at at Trump, one after the other after the other. They get Elliot Broidy, who's the top, you know, drag him all the way to Shenzhen, give him eight million dollars, give his wife eight million dollars, <laughs> and he's linked up with the the J Lo, who's like. Uh, a bag man for the Malaysian corrupt prime minister who stole billions of dollars because the Chinese are protecting that corruption right. too. And they link up with the UAE guys who are like willing to like facilitate some extradition shenanigans where like, whoa, we'll go to Dubai and then he'll get disappeared and somehow end up in Beijing. So you've got the Emiratis, the Malaysians and the Chinese Communist Party paying off a singer from the Fugees and Elliot Broidy to go get this guy, all right? And they get Steve Wynn involved in it. And Steve Wynn meets Trump at a fundraiser, gives him this package of information. It was misreported as a letter, but it wasn't a letter. He gives him a dossier, basically, on Guang Guai. Says he raped all these people. He's like, Trump, next day, Trump's like, we got to get the rapist, right? Trump doesn't know any of that backstory, but he's just like, oh, let's get the rapist. And Bannon's like, wait a second. Are we just extraditing people based on, like, Chinese Communist Party letters <laughs> passed at fundraisers now? Is that yeah. really what we're doing? Maybe we should have a think about this, okay? 
And he actually stopped it, not just Bannon. There were other people involved, including Ponder. They're like, listen, Mr. President, you know, let's just take a, a beat here and maybe we shouldn't extradite people to China without thinking about it. Maybe that's a bad precedent to send. And Trump's like, okay, okay. And then he forgot about it. <laughs> so then Bannon gets fired and signs up to go work for Guo and gets a million dollars to right. start a media organization with Guo, a media organization that Bannon still runs to this day. And everything seems hunky-dory and they start a, they're, they're making YouTube videos and, you know, hanging out on the yacht, smoking cigars <laughs> and life is good. But then all of a sudden it's like, we, you know, we find out that like, oh, well, Guo is being investigated for like several SEC violations. He hired another company to investigate dissidents all over the United States. That company sued him and called him a dissident hunter. And you're like, wait, why is the dissident hunting dissidents? Maybe he's not a dissident, you know, because that's not what dissidents do. They don't really hunt other dissidents with millions of dollars. You know, then Bannon gets arrested on the yacht. Then Guo disappears. Then he comes back. And then Brady pleads guilty to the, the Farrah violation. You know, they're all fighting each other. There's like American billionaires and, and Chinese billionaires suing each other and sticking different parts of the FBI on each other. You know, there's like one part of the FBI that's investigating Brody and another part of the FBI that's investigating Guo on behalf of Brody. Yeah. And they don't even know what the hell is going on. And, and Bannon is like just on TV every day, like enjoying it all and, you know, making money to boot. I, I mean, and, and then finally, th this all culminated, of course, in the Hunter Biden scandal, because the Hunter Biden laptop material was mostly leaked on Guo's website. Now, you find the answer to that mystery. And you will have broken the story. Of, I, I couldn't, I tried my best. I couldn't get to the bottom of it. <laughs> but why is it that all of the Hunter Biden material is coming out on the Woe's website and spliced with like disinformation in a way that actually harms its credibility and claiming that the CCP is the one who actually uh, honey trapped Hunter Biden and stole all of his stuff, not some blind Delaware repairman who nobody can find. You know what I mean? So Guo was like involved in all of these crucial points with all these crucial people the whole four years and now and and it's just it's just it's such a tangled web and there's just so much litigation and so much so many prosecutions i don't know if we'll ever, ever untangle it i can't claim to have untangled it i just don't i, yeah. I can't i can't quite understand it all some a lot of shady stuff going on there no i think that really sums up well <laughs> does it I don't even the point that no, well, it well, does, no, you know you you summed yeah. up why you don't have a um catchy two word summation yes. of everything that's going on here, which is, well, actually China challenge just best to describe it. So I want to hit three last things here before um, we wrap. Um, so we could hit them relatively quickly just because sure. they're more on the news. Firstly, let's start with what happened in Alaska at the first summit between sure. the Biden team um, and the China team. Um, depending on where you're looking at this, if you're in right-wing media, you think that the wolf warriors of China showed up and steamrolled the Biden people. This is just like JFK blowing it with um, Khrushchev um, in, the, you know, uh, in Czechoslovakia. If you're, I don't really know as much what the center left position is. So just summarize, summarize like what happened and what your perspective is on it. As you may have guessed, I would say all of the extreme analyses are wrong. Okay. Mm -hmm. What here, here's how I know that. That that harangue, that 17 minute list of grievances that, you know, that that uh that Yang Ji sure laid out uh, uh in Alaska to Blinken and Sullivan, it's almost exactly the same harangue and list of grievances that he laid out to Bannon and Navarro and Mike Flynn and KT Farland and Jared Kushner and Jared Kushner's parents building during the 2016 transition. It's the same message, it's the same yes. shtick, okay? The, the difference was that he did it publicly, right? And there's a reason he did it publicly, of course, is because China's feeling the pressure and they're responding in the only way that their system really allows, which is to be defensive and aggressive. In other words, what it says to me is that, you know, the the Chinese, the, he's got an audience of one, <laughs> Xi Jinping, right? He There's no mechanism inside the Chinese system, perhaps, that can, self-correct, which is a, a, a weird and horrible thing to think about if you take it to its logical conclusion. But just for the sake of this conversation, right, they can't backtrack. They can't concede on their first meeting, but they can't. So they got to be tough. Right. But that doesn't mean that that toughness is justified or genuine. OK. And it doesn't mean that they're disrespecting the 
I mean, sure, it's a little bit disrespectful to the Biden team, but it doesn't mean the Biden team played it wrong. The Biden team just they just said what they were going to say in one way or the other. OK, so that, you know, it was actually a pretty re- reasonable middle ground, if you if you want to think of it that way. But it's just the first volley. It's just the first squaring off. They're just dancing around each other. OK, they haven't actually done it yet. OK, so yeah. don't overthink it. You know, I mean, this is what this is what it is now. The relationship's not going to be great. So that doesn't have to be terrible. It doesn't have to be a cold war. It doesn't have to be a conflict, but it's not going to be great. It's not going to be happy anymore because that's the way they wanted it. That's what they, that's the decision they made when they set up the concentration camps. Okay. That's the choice that they made. And, uh, and when they told us we're not allowed to say anything about the concentration camps, I'm sorry, we're going to say something, you know what I mean? And then they shipped yeah. us the hair and the cotton from the slave labor and from the people in, and told us, put it on our heads and shut up. No, we're not going to do that. Sorry. Screw you. I'm glad that you put it that way because everybody was trying to like narrative twist out of this. And I was like, guys, I cover the stuff for a living. Like sounds well, pretty similar to what they said for a long time. But what you're, like, what you're, getting, calm down. But what you're yeah. getting at is really important yeah. point because everyone's abusing the China issue to advance their own agendas. Right. Yes. That happens on the left and the right and in the administration and in the intelligence community. Those guys, intelligence community guys who are always linking to the same three reporters. Right. So this is the same three guys. You think those three <laughs> intelligence community guys who are leaking to the same four reporters every day about whatever it is that they don't they don't know everything. OK, they've got an exactly. agenda, too. And, you know, I, I like I don't know. Do I have an agenda? I'm, I mean, I think my agenda is just to get it right, to be right at the end, not to be no, right you, in the moment, but to be right at the end. And that requires critical thinking and reevaluating your assumptions. If you didn't even if you didn't think it came from the lab, you're like, oh, well. I remember a year ago, I tweeted it didn't come from the left. That's okay. You don't have to delete that tweet. You are allowed to take new information and then think to yourself, okay, maybe it did come from the left. That's okay. That's what intelligent critical thinking is missing from our political discussion because everything's on teams and the China issue is not a team thing. It shouldn't be a team thing. It has to not be. Expound on that a little bit because you, you've you been very prominent right now in the news around the Wuhan lab. We had Dr. Robert Redfield. I talked about this on my show today. He came out and said that he believes, this former CDC director, that the Wuh- the coronavirus originated from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. You basically have tracked this from the beginning. There's been a lot of high-profile fights. The New York Times calling it debunked, putting the claim eventually without evidence why do you think this matters, Josh? Why why does this debate matter? The debate it's the, the, the debate itself, yeah. right? We're not gonna prove the science. The origin on this matters because without tracing the origin, we won't know how this started. So we can't prevent the next one. You want to prevent yeah. the next one? We have to figure out how this one started. Okay. So that's crucial for our public health and the health of our society and our citizenry and the world. So we have so it's not about blame, okay? But let's mm-hmm. talk about blame, okay? And 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 you know, I under let me just say this to all of you out there in TV land. I don't blame you for being confused about this origin lab theory thing. I don't blame you one iota for listening to Donald Trump, you know, say the lab did it, Kung flu, and then thinking to yourself, oh, wait, I want to be against that, right? I get why that happened. And what I try to do in the book is I try to unpack why that happened and how a scientific and forensic question, which is how this thing started, got politicized beyond any recognition. And we all share some blame from that including the media, including the Trump people, including the Democrats. You know what I mean? It's not a it's not a political question. Right. So, you know, here we are a year later. And what the uh, I don't know when this is going to air, but the WHO report will have come out or it just came out. Okay, so it just came out. Yeah. Hey, everybody, you, you, you saw that story today about the WHO report and it just puts everybody back to their corners. Oh, the WHO report said the lab accident theory is crazy. Oh, wait a second. That got, those people are totally conflicted because it's the best Friends of the people in the lab. You can't have the people who are the best friends of the people in the lab investigate the lab. It doesn't make any sense. It would be like, you know, if you were accused of being the coronavirus and they asked your brother to like investigate, it doesn't, somebody would be like, hey, wait. Josh, I just love the struggle to come up with the right metaphor because it just so is so 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 evidently bad. You don't even need a metaphor. It's like, you just don't do this. Here's here's what happened. Here's what happened in our media. And I, I, you know, I'm not a media critic. I'm just a guy who worked in the DC news business for 17 years every day. Okay. For eight different organizations. So I've earned the right to have an opinion about the media environment. That's all screwed up is that all of these papers, you know, they heard this, they have confirmation bias and source bias. The confirmation bias is, oh, well, it was the market. Then these crazy Trump people wanted to say it was the lab, but we're going to stick with our market theory. You know what I mean? Despite that, they just don't want to be wrong. You know what I mean? But that's not how 
journalism is supposed to work. That's not how truth works. That's not how investigation works. And source bias, right? All the sources for those early stories are these conflicted scientists who are still out there writing the, on, the, you know, on TV today. You know, oh well, no, well we did the, we, we asked the people at the lab, did you do it? And they said no. We were like, oh well, that's that. <laughs> did you do it? You know, no, I didn't. Do, okay, all right. Well, thanks for right, letting us into Wuhan. Right. We'll we're going to go look for frozen fish packages with coronavirus in Norway. That's what they're <laughs> asking. Like, like, and so if you're just an alien, you came down from like, and you didn't know what happened over the last eleven months of the coronavirus, and someone said to you, okay, listen, uh, coronavirus broke out in Wuhan. There's a lab with all the risky bat coronavirus research, uh, which had lax safety standards as exposed in cables that I reported on exclusively. And mm. they were doing all this crazy bat coronavirus research that they won't tell anybody about. And there's all this evidence that, you know, that, that, that they were hiding all this stuff that the Biden administration confirmed, by the way. Or it's possible that like there was a frozen fish package in Norway that, you know, that got shipped here and then it didn't. It never spilled over anywhere else. But then, when it got to Wuhan, that turned into the greatest pandemic in human history, ten miles from the lab. What would you think? What would you think is the most likely of those two scenarios? So, in other words, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like at this point, I'm, I'm not even telling. I'm begging people to just like think again, think again. Okay. There's a Adam Grant book. It's called Think Again. It means, you know, it doesn't matter if you were right or wrong in April. It doesn't matter if you like Trump or you don't like Trump. Just be open to the idea that the lab might have been involved. And then all we yes. have to do is investigate. And by the way, if you're in the WHO team and you said the lab didn't do it before the investigation, in other words, if you already made your conclusion before you started investigating, then I don't give you any credibility. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's close out with this question then. You, at the end, write that the way to succeed in the China challenge context isn't through pursuing a race to the bottom. I think the exact quote is a race to the bottom would equal a loss. And then a race to the top is actually something that we can win. Can you just articulate that? Um, Cause I think that's a good note to leave everyone on. Yes. I mean, and this is, I think actually is a kind of like a, a feel good consensus point. If we can find one in the China debate is that, you know, the best way that we can compete with China is to, be the best version of ourselves, of our country, and of our humanity, okay? And that means respecting individuals and their rights to freedom and the path of the enlightenment that's given human beings the ability to have some sort of agency and dignity, okay? And that's important. And if we start there, and then we move on to rule of law, you know, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, you know, uh, freedom of travel, freedom on the internet, right? Those are really good things. People want those things. People all over the world, if they're if they're not if they don't have a minder standing behind them, will answer you that those things are good. Okay. The problem is we also have to connect that with a system that delivers for people in their daily lives. And that's yeah. where the global elite, so to speak, DC establishment has failed. Okay. That's where the globalization did not account for the equal distribution of its benefits. And that's the dissatisfaction that both that, that fueled the rise of nationalism that Donald Trump very rightly called out, um, you know, and we, we have to fix that. And if we can, you know, merge our values with taking care of our people, then what are the Chinese Communist Party going to say? They're like, oh, no, right now their deal is it's, it's, it's like a. A, a false promise. If you just give away all of your agency and you you agree that the people are the property and chattel of the party state, you could have riches and be out of poverty, and you're going to have a really cool you know computer, and your phone's going to have a really good camera. And yes, that camera is going to spot the Uyghur on your street, and he's going to get scooped up, but that's not your problem. Yeah, uh, that's their pitch. Okay, our pitch has to be: Hey, listen, you could have the right to think what you want say what you want, love who you want, have some influence over your government and your leadership in the way that your community is organized, and you get to eat, and you get to, you know, have shelter, and you get to, you know, be a successful member of that society. If we could pull that off, that would be it. It would be game over, okay? Mm -hmm. We would win. We, that, would, that, would, that would be not only a victory for the West, but a victory for humanity. That's what we have to strive for, and I hope you all, all join me in that effort. 
Absolutely, so such an inspirational thing, man. Uh, like we said, really appreciate you joining us. One of legitimately one of our favorite books we've read in a long time. It'll be available on our bookshop and everywhere. Josh, any anything else you want to plug? Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Washington Post, whatever. No, that's good. You know, peace right. and love. Be be kind to one another. Thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate Anytime. it. Anytime.